Good evening and welcome. Thanks for coming. I, I've had some very complimentary introductions in my time, but I don't think I've ever been promised as, as predicting the future. So I want to I uh, uh, qualify what, what Brian said uh, very quickly. I, but I will talk about uh, how we can think about innovation, and particularly how we can think about innovation and how it will shape our environmental future. Uh, to give you a bit of background, my, ba my own training is as an engineer. In my career, I, I initially started, with, uh, with all due respect to the Microsoft folks in the crowd, I originally started at Apple Computer uh, in uh, the late 80s and worked there as an engineer in the Silicon Valley, uh, first at, a, at another product design consulting firm, IDEO Product Development, and then at, at Apple, uh, living in what was really the, you know, the, the capital of innovation at the time. And uh, after a while there, I, I, I decided to come back and study the process, uh, because while it was a lot of fun to do, it was, it was equally fun to, to think about. But uh, what that means is that what I, uh, my background really was as a technologist first and then as a, as a scholar of technology and innovation. And only recently did I move into the energy and the environmental space. And I moved there uh, for the same reason that a number of you are here in the crowd today, simply because over the last decade it's, it's become too important to ignore. Uh, and, and so getting involved in that was simply an, under, you know, an opportunity to, to, to look at how what I understood, or at least what I studied, innovation, might play a strong role in, in changing the way we live. What's happened in the last two years has been really a sea change in our appreciation for the environment, for climate change, and for energy security. And I think uh, nowhere has innovation all of a sudden been pulled onto center stage as fast as it has in these areas. And that's obviously good for somebody who studies innovation. But I think it's, it's also a, a particular challenge because, in fact, now that innovation has become central to these issues, it becomes even more important that we truly understand the process, uh, not only from a perspective of government policy, but also from a perspective of corporate strategy. Uh, that fact has been made abundantly clear. Um, Thomas Friedman, writing in Hot, Flat, and Crowded, said, we are not going to regulate our way out of our problems. We can only innovate our way out. Stephen Chu, our new uh, Secretary of Energy, said, our previous investments in science led to the birth of the semiconductor, computer, the biotechnology industries that have greatly added to our economic prosperity. Now we need similar breakthroughs in energy. All good, right? Who can, who can complain about innovation um, solving our problems? Well, I think the most important thing we can say here is what do we understand about innovation? And when we point to issues like the semiconductor or opportunities, innovations like the semiconductor or the computer or, or biotechnology or the steam engine or the electric light or the automobile or penicillin, it's easy to look back on those and see the impact they had on our lives and the problems they solved. But hindsight has a certain advantage to it. And it's not as easy to look forward, know what we should be doing now, to achieve the same results that those innovations brought us before. In fact, I think it's almost dangerous. No, I don't think it's almost dangerous. I think it's downright dangerous to take the approach that looking backwards can give us the right way of looking forward. In fact, uh, the White Queen in Alice in Wonderland said it best. It's a poor sort of memory that only works backwards. We need to understand innovation well enough to know how it should guide us, both our governmental policy and our corporate strategy, in moving forward. And to that end, I want to talk about three things tonight, three criteria for thinking about innovation that comes not from the popular understandings of innovation and from, uh, from certainly the, the impact that past innovations have had, but rather from the study of innovations past with a look to understanding not how they look from now, but how they looked before they actually happened, what would we, sort of, we call the, the prehistory of innovations. So let me talk about the first one of these. Uh, and, and in particular, it's called the great man theory of innovation. This is perhaps the most insidious because it is the way we tell stories of innovation. Technological historians have described it as the great man theory in particular because it has a fundamental assumption to it. And that's that for every great idea, there was a single point in time at which a single person had that idea. Before that, the idea didn't exist. After that, the world was never the same. 
And we can go down the list, and you'll recognize them. And if you're from England, you'll have different heroes there. If you're from Germany or Europe, you'll have different heroes. But they will each have a date, and they will each have an idea. And it was on that date that the world changed. Now, obviously, you know, we can look at those objectively and say, well, that's absurd. But from about the time you were 10 years old on, you were taught these names and these dates and told to remember them because those were the dates that the world changed. And it's simply not the way it works. Innovation doesn't evolve in that way. And I'll give you just a very simple, very brief example, but an example of probably the most iconic of our innovators and our innovations, the electric light. So Thomas Edison developed the electric light. He introduced it to the public in 1882. Right now, it's in every Microsoft clip art you know, collection you can find. Right now, probably across the US, it's, it's what, between 9 and, and 12 in the morning there. I can imagine several thousand PowerPoint presentations going off with a, with a light bulb in them to communicate just how creative the project is, or the team is, or the idea is. But in fact, if you look at the history, Edison didn't invent the light bulb. His patent for the incandescent bulb was rejected because it was too similar to one filed 30 years earlier. In fact, he can't even claim credit for the incandescent bulb because we know that there were incandescent bulbs burning in a laboratory in 1860 in Boston when Edison worked there. By the time Edison flipped the switch on the Pearl Street Station in New York and brought light and electricity to the masses, Brooklyn Bridge was already lit by electricity. Central Park was already lit at night by electricity. Buildings like uh, hotels and manors and, and ships were already lit by electric bulbs. And yet somehow we give Edison credit for having invented the electric light. So the first point I want to make with all this is, in fact, he didn't. But that's all right. Because my first point is, it's not about the idea. Innovations are rarely about the actual central idea that tends to give them the most credit and the most easily identified label. What do I mean by that? What I mean is actually even more uh, obviously described here. Mousetraps, the second icon of innovation. People remember Ralph Waldo Emerson's famous quote, if you build a better mousetrap, the world will beat its path to your door. This is, in fact, what we're placing our bets on when we bet on innovation saving us in climate change. That if we can just build a better mousetrap, the world will beat a path to our door. But interestingly, that's wrong. Emerson's wrong for two reasons. One, he never said that. He actually said if you sell better grain, Better, uh, you know, uh, uh, a better wood or a bigger pig, you'll find a hard beaten road by your door. Meaning, if you're a good businessman and you sell what everybody else is selling, but you sell a better product, people will buy it from you instead. Good, simple advice for a businessman. It wasn't until seven years after he died that a journalist turned the words around a little bit and since then have been driving entrepreneurs and policymakers to their doom with the belief that if you simply build a better mousetrap, if you build a better light bulb, if you build a better anything, the marketing, the distribution, all of the adoption will take care of itself. Now, the second reason is wrong is because we have records from the US Patent Office since 1828. And since 1828, over 4,400 mousetraps have been patented. Of those, only 24 have ever made money. And of those, there are only two dominant designs in the market. The first is the Snap Trap by Victor, which was the original company that introduced the Snap Trap in 1897. The second is the Sticky Trap, which is a sort of a 1970s marvel. It's industrial adhesives, slapped on cardboard, shrink wrapped, and sold as a cleaner, easier solution. Anybody who's used that goes immediately back to the snap trap, which is a much more humane way of capturing and killing mice. Nonetheless, the point I want to make with this is, if you build a better mouse trap, odds are 3,398 to 2 that nothing will happen. If we spend our money investing in new technology simply for the sake of developing better mouse traps, odds are against us that anything will happen. 
So that's the first thing we need to think about, the criteria we're really looking for when we look to invest in solutions for clean energy or climate change. Now the second one is a related idea, but it has to do with what we think innovation is and to what extent we think innovation is in fact about bringing new ideas to the market. So let me talk about what I think what's the second of three core sort of energy innovations. The first, the light bulb, the second, the, the automobile, and the third, the steam engine that I'll talk about tonight and give you this example to talk about what you think innovation is. Why is innovation, uh, uh, wh what, what makes innovation so impactful? If it's not about the idea, what is it about? Well, this is the Ford Motor Company, and this is the Ford Motor Company in 1914. Henry Ford, uh, you know, as you'll probably guess from my position, did not invent the automobile. In fact, the Ford Motor Company was his fourth car company. Literally, he drove the first three into the ditch. Uh, he liked to drive really fast cars. He liked to design really fast cars. And the first three times he built the car company, he designed really fast cars and then drove them into a ditch. And back in those days, cars were so expensive that you didn't build a second one. Your company just folded. But what he decided to do with his fourth car company was build a car for the masses, for everybody. This was not a new idea. Other people were looking at that. It's roughly equivalent to the $400 personal computer today. But that said, he decided to build a car for the masses. And the Model T, of course, was not his first attempt. Nobody would name a car. If anybody knows software revisions, you know that you don't name any revision T until you get there. But he developed the Model T, and he, and he particularly developed mass production, the ability to take a car that had previously sold for $2,000 and within five years sell it for $300, and thus enable the entire market to drive uh, and own their own cars. So he developed the, mass, the, 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 the method of mass production to produce the Model T at a cost that the market could afford. How did he develop mass production? What was so great about mass production that it would, in fact, go on to change the world? Well, if we look at it, in fact, you can see here, in 1906, he was building 1,600 cars a year. He introduced the Model T in mass production, and in 1914, seven years later, he was building 265,000 cars a year. What was different? What made that possible? Well, forgive my technical roots, but I'm going to drop into a little bit of technical explanation here for a second. What made mass production have such an impact was that it was made up of four core elements, interchangeable parts. If you're going to build 300 or 265,000 cars a year, you're going to need to build 40 or 10,000 cars a day. And that means that any one of 40,000 tires built that day are going to have to fit on any one of 10,000 chassis. Prior to Henry Ford, cars were made by skilled craftsmen. But you simply couldn't afford that. So it was the ability to make interchangeable parts and put any piece on any part of the car coming down that day. The second was continuous flow production. If you're going to have 10,000 cars built in a day, you need to have them moving smoothly through the factory. And everything that had to be done on that car was done in exactly the order in which it was done. So much so that in, in Ford's sort of peak, he had barges of iron ore pulling up at one end of the factory and Model T's driving out the other in a perfect mass balance equation. Because there was no way you could put 10,000 cars in a corner of the factory to start work on them again the next day. The third piece was the assembly line. As Ford said, for eight hours a day, the men become part of the machine. If you're going to have continuous flow production and you're going to have interchangeable parts, you need people standing on the line and standing very close to one another, doing very simple tasks, one small task at a time, and moving the work past them. The last piece, and few realize this, was the electric motor. In fact, the electric motor made mass production possible because it allowed you to organize around continuous flow production rather than using a steam engine to power all of your factory uh, equipment. You could put the work and the, and, the, and the equipment exactly where it needed to go and then run wires to it. And thus, it allowed all of the other pieces, interchangeable parts, continuous flow production, the assembly line. So those were the ideas that made up mass production. But if it wasn't about the idea of mass production, what was it? Why was mass production so impactful in Ford's motor car company? Why did it change the landscape of industrial manufacturing and give us, in fact, the century of the automobile. In fact, it was not because it was a new idea, but precisely the opposite. The reason Ford and the motor car, Ford Motor Car Company had the impact that it had 
was because those ideas all existed before. Interchangeable parts was an idea that was 100 years old. It was first presented to the US Congress in 1797 as a way to build muskets and rifles. By the early 1800s, a machine tool industry had grown up to build interchangeable parts. By the late 1800s, you could buy bicycles, sewing machines, and agricultural equipment made with interchangeable parts. By the time Ford got to it, he was able to hire two of the best machine tool designers and salesmen in the country who had seen and installed much of this work, much of this equipment already in, in other industries, and give them carte blanche to design his factory. After that uh, um, is, is continuous slow production. Continuous slow production was also not new. It was being used in the food industries, and particularly in foundries and in breweries. And when Ford's engineers built his car company, they built it out of catalogs for continuous flow production, for the use of hoppers and grains and other things and, and, and gutters to feed equipment to the worker. The third piece is the assembly line, and it too wasn't new. In fact, in 1906, Upton Sinclair published a book called The Jungle, which cataloged the atrocities of the meatpacking industry in Chicago, less than 100 miles from where Ford was working. Ford and his engineers, when they wanted to design an assembly line for the automobile plant, went to Chicago and visited the Swift meatpacking plant where they saw cows killed and canned. And they literally walked out of there saying, if they can kill cows that way, they can build cars that, we can build cars that way. And they studied the factories and they took copious notes of how many people worked, how close apart they worked, how fast the work moved past them, how complicated was the work, how much did you pay them, how did you train them, how many managers did you need for a workforce, where did you find these workers? And they brought them back to the Ford Motor Car Company and they installed exactly the same assembly line. What was the disassembly line of the meatpacking industry they brought simply into the, into the car company. And then lastly, the electric motor. Again, not a new technology. In fact, few people realize this, but Henry Ford's first job was at the Edison Electric Company. And he left when he failed to convince Edison that the, elect that the car was more important than, than electricity. But it was already in use in printing and textiles by the time Ford got to it. So all of this is to say, in a very long-winded way, that Ford and the, the mass production that Ford brought to the auto industry and to the world had its impact not because it was new, but precisely the opposite, because it had existed already in so many other places and in so many other ways. What Ford did was connect those people, those ideas, those technologies under one roof in a way that they all worked together beautifully to help one another. That's why it had the impact it did. Had Ford tried to invent any one of those elements, he would have failed. In fact, the wonderful thing is Ford understood that completely. He was asked to testify on who invented the internal combustion engine, and he said, I invented nothing new. I simply assembled a car into a car, the discoveries of other men, of other men behind whom were centuries of work. Had I worked 50 or 10 or even five years before, I would have failed. So it is with every new thing. Progress happens when all the factors that make for it are ready, and then it is inevitable. To teach that a comparatively few men are responsible for the greatest forward steps of mankind is the worst sort of nonsense. Ford was wonderfully astute, wonderfully observant of the fact that the only reason he succeeded was because he didn't try to do anything new. He simply put together old ideas in a new way. And that leads me to the second criteria we should use when we think about innovation, which is it's more about connecting than inventing. Sure, there's a good idea in there somewhere, but it's how we connect that idea with other ideas and with other people and other resources that give it the impact that it ultimately has. And if we're going to evaluate new technologies in climate change or in the environment or in energy, we need to be able to look at the ideas and see how they're going to connect in new ways. Let me give you a, a, a more recent example simply to, to, to drive this point home. I, as I said, I worked at Apple in the early 80s. I, I, do, I do have the, uh, the distinction of never having bought Microsoft stock despite all of, so many of my friends having moved up to Redmond uh, at, at the same time and going to work for Microsoft. They're all done now. They're retired and they're, they're polishing their boats. But, uh, um, but Apple, as a company, had the great man culture. 
we were all inventing the world. We were revolutionizing the world one desktop at a time. That was our mantra. And when I was at Apple as an engineer, I was given a million dollars to develop the power supply of the future, the most innovative power supply, the, the lightest, smallest, and most innovative power supply ever in the personal computer industry. Now, just the fact that I have to explain, the power supply is that little box that comes attached to the cable that you plug into the, to the wall. Uh, and I can promise you, uh, I, 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 de I delivered that power supply. It was for the Macintosh Duo back in, the, in, in 1990. But I can also promise you that not a single laptop was sold because of my power supply. That didn't matter. That's like you know, somebody going into a delicatessen and buying the sandwich because they really want the pickle that comes with it. Nobody bought a laptop because of my power supply. In fact, I don't even think it really rated. But that doesn't matter because at Apple, it didn't matter at all. It was about everybody doing everything for the first time, completely changing everything we were doing. It culminated with Apple building a, a state-of-the-art factory in Fremont that would never allow them to, to cost-effectively produce anything through the 1990s because it was so state-of-the-art. But in fact, when the iPod came out, I realized that Apple had turned around. They had made a fundamental shift in the way they viewed innovation. Why do I say that? Because prior to the iPod, prior, in fact, to Steve Jobs returning to Apple in the late 90s, Apple was going to reinvent everything, like I reinvented the power supply. When the iPod came out, it was the 13th MP3 player on the market. Now, in the old days, Apple would have said, we can do better, and they would have come out with a, mar a, a machine, an MP3 player that was better in terms of sound quality or anything else than the rest. But Apple didn't do that. In fact, what they did was they went out and they hired Portal Player, which was the hardware. They designed the, the, the chips and the, and the hardware that was already being used in building the other successful MP3 players on the market. And then they went out and they licensed with a company called Pixo Design for the, inter in the operating system, the, the user interface. And then they added their industrial design, but they used the suppliers for all of the other MP3 players, linear technologies, Sony, Sharp, Wilson Microelectronics. And then again, they licensed a wide range of other technologies that were critical in using MP3s. And they got to the market in eight months. Not because they wanted to invent or tried to invent anything or even improve on anything, but simply because they went out and tapped what was already out there. The next thing they did was, I think, even more important. They saw that while everybody else had an MP3 player on the market too, they could do better. And the way they could do better was, in fact, by recognizing that they could not only connect the components within the iPod, but also the components outside the iPod. In fact, they could do a better job of networking the MP3 player with the iTunes Music Store and the personal computer. Uh, just a quick show of hands. How many people have an iPod in their family? Are we pretty familiar? OK. Other MP3 players that I'm missing? Zoom. So, but not only did they see that they could connect to the iTunes Music Store and the, and the, and the personal computer, but they saw that, in fact, the value, the true value of the player was in what those connected to. And so Steve Jobs was able to call the, the CEO of Universal Vivendi, one of the record labels, and convince them, and then the other labels behind them, that if they sold their music online through the Apple iTunes Music Store, they were going to be safe. They could sell them because Apple had a digital rights management system. They could sell digital music online through the iTunes Music Store. And users of the iPod could then purchase this music in digital form and immediately go and play it. This was fundamentally what made the iPod network so effective. Not only do you enjoy using the iPod itself, but you enjoy the elements that it connects you to. First the music, then the podcast, then the internet, then pictures, and then television shows and movies. And now with the iPhone, hundreds of thousands of applications. In fact, the wonderful thing about the iPhone, as one technology reviewer said, is it's one of the few pieces of technology that get more valuable the longer you own it. And that's what the network is about.
That's what connecting is about. The iPod, now the iPhone, connects you not only to the, the system itself, but also to all of the different applications and all of the different software and all of the different content that you could enjoy only through this device. The technology connects you to things that you didn't even know you could be connected to when you first bought the machine. Innovation is about connecting in this way. It's not about the particular idea, but about the opportunities that such a connection enables. So we'll come back to that in a, in a, in a little while. The last example I want to bring up is an example that, again, uh, is, is really important when evaluating innovation and the opportunity for innovation. And the example I'll use is James Watt and the steam engine. So I'm going to start getting repetitive here. Watt didn't invent the steam engine. In fact, it was about 75 years old. It had been used to, to pump water out of coal mines in England for about 75 years before James Watt made a fundamental improvement to the Newcomen engine, which was the standard engine at the time. The improvement he made is circled in, in a, a little dark red there, but it's, it's, it was technically speaking called the separate condenser, which allowed the steam to condense in a, in a separate cylinder so that the main cylinder that the piston was working in wouldn't have to heat up and cool down and heat up and cool down with each cycle to go from something that allowed steam to exist to something that would uh, um, precipitate steam into water. Now this was a small change. In fact, it was such a small change that, that the first 20 years or so, that was the only thing that Watt and his company could change in the design of the steam engine because he was really simply replacing old Newcomen engines with the new improved steam, Watt steam engine. In, in coal mines. But that's not why we remember James Watt. In fact, the reason we remember Watt is not because of the more efficient ways in which people pump water out of coal mines today, but it was about the, the impact that the steam engine had in ways and in applications and in markets that Watt himself never imagined. And one of the reasons why that happened, and the reason I dwell on that technology of the separate condenser, is because unbeknownst to Watt, when he was designing the separate condenser, all he was concerned with was reducing the amount of coal needed to heat the water into steam. And he did a great job. His, his, his steam engine was about 75% more efficient than anybody else's. And he was pretty happy with that, pretty proud of that. But unbeknownst to him, that change made a few other things possible that had not yet been possible. Prior to that, as I said, the Newcomen engine, you would pump steam into a, major, a, a large cylinder and then squirt water in, the steam would cool down, it would precipitate into water, there would be a vacuum created, it would, it would pull the piston in and do work. By having a separate condenser, it didn't have to heat up and cool down, so you could actually run it faster because the separate condenser did all the work of the heating and cooling. So now you could run your steam engines faster than about 20 RPMs. You could run them at 100 RPMs or greater. But that caused a problem, which was because you no longer had water in the cylinder, and again, apologies for getting technical, the piston in the cylinder had to fit very, very well. The only way he was able to do that was to bring in a supplier who, knew how to, who learned how to bore uh, cannons, uh, cannon holes uh, much more accurately. But in the process of making the separate condenser work, he developed a new way to, to, to build a tighter tolerance in the cylinder, and that allowed for greater pressure. And that greater pressure and the greater RPMs changed the steam engine so that now it became economically viable to run on a railroad. And it became economically viable to put inside a factory. And with that increased speed, you could start turning wheels and turning gears at a much higher rate and therefore use the steam engine in a whole range of other markets. And the reason we remember Watt is because while Newcomen kept making those engines and kept supplying them to the coal industry, Watt's engines were being picked up by engineers for use in textiles, and in the railroad, and in water power, all sorts of other industries were starting to pick up the steam engine and run with it and use it in different ways. And the important point I want to make with that, and the last point, is that revolutions set their own course. The steam engine, had it been for what, would have been a profoundly improved efficiency in mining coal and nothing else. But in fact, it was all of the other applications that made the steam engine what we know today. And that's the, the last important point that I want to make. Where do we see that now? The internet's a great example. When ARPA 
the Advanced Research Project Agency of the Defense, uh, Department of Defense in the US, first funded the ARPANET, which was the origin of the internet. It funded it at four universities across uh, uh, essentially the West as an idea to enable its researchers, government researchers, to have access to the computing power that was distributed across the country because computing power was very limited. So they created a network that enabled them to do that. They had no idea what they were starting. But fairly quickly, through the 70s, graduate students started to play on those machines sitting in the universities and on the network and they started to come up with new ways of using it. The first of which, the first uh, uh, surprising innovation to come out of that was email. Curse it if you will. That was one of the first applications that made the internet successful to people other than the original program funders who sponsored it. Now all of a sudden people could see new ways of using it. Obviously the internet moved on from email, but if you look at this chart, much of the explosive growth in the internet, and this is simply in the number of people logged onto the internet at any time, took place in the 90s, and particularly in the late 90s. But it took, places in way, it took, uh, it took place in ways that nobody expected. And in fact, this is even, in, in creating this chart, this is even a little bit of a misleading chart. Because this is the number of people who are using the internet. But imagine, if you will, if we were in 1970 and we thought that this many million people would be using the internet to what? To access other computers on other university campuses to run large scale uh, simulations of nuclear winters. That was what it was originally intended to do. But now we're on you know, watching YouTube, buying things from Amazon, doing all sorts of things that, but just simply looking at this chart doesn't reveal how much the internet has evolved in use, how much it has set its own course and change the way we live in ways that nobody was expecting. So there are really, that I, and I'm proposing tonight, three criteria we should be looking at for thinking about innovations in green technology today. First, they should be not the ideas, but new combinations of old ideas. Their value will second come from the network, the network that they enable. And third, they will evolve. And if they can't evolve, they won't have the impact that we hope they will have. So what does that mean for energy, particularly energy efficiency and ICT, information and communications technology? Well, very quickly, this is, this is a chart of energy demand in the US. I use this to present the context in which information communication technology can have an impact. If you look at it, this is a chart of energy demand, and what you'll see is that transportation takes up about 40%, but roughly thirds, in thirds they're split between residential and light commercial energy consumption, industrial energy consumption, and transportation. And then we think, okay, well, how can we solve energy efficiency? We can address each of these areas. But if you look at this chart in a different way, what you find, in fact, if you look at the inefficiencies associated, is the chart gets a little different. That pie now switches over to be about 16% is useful energy in residences. Another 5% is actually wasted energy in residences. Air conditioning that has to cool the hottest part of the house down to the temperature that you would like, and the coldest part of the house gets even colder, things like that. Industrial energy used is 17%, and industrial waste is about 4%. Transportation is about 6% actual useful energy, whereas about 24% is in waste. The internal combustion engine has a long way to go before it's truly efficient. In fact, that should tell you something about the future of the internal combustion engine, because anybody with that much room for improvement is not going to roll over and let hydrogen or some other car, you know, other car technology to take over. But the last, this big black gap, is in fact the amount of energy lost in bringing power to homes, to businesses, and elsewhere. And most of that's all supply-side waste. And the reason I bring this up is because information and communications technology is one of the few energy sources, the energy opportunities, that allows us to address not only the waste in residential and in, in commercial and industrial and, and transportation, but also the supply-side waste. If we look at where we have the most opportunity to bring in a new technology, 
We can think about solar and we can think about wind and other things like that as green energy sources that can address our energy demands, but that doesn't resolve the underlying waste. And information communication technology is one of those aspects of making the, the grid smarter, essentially, by finding those inefficiencies, monitoring them, and in many ways avoiding them. So the first argument I, I want to get away with quickly, which is that information communication technology has an enormous impact on energy efficiency, which is the single largest energy source we have available to us today. If we can take that, that waste and in fact harness it by reducing it, we have an opportunity to create energy in effect. Now, why do I think ICT is in fact good? It's, it simply gets on the list as one of those other technologies. But in fact, the reason it's good is because 61% of our total energy produced is wasted, is lost as wa essentially waste heat. And ICT has the opportunity then to go after that. If we compare it on the three criteria, new combinations of old ideas, ICT wasn't built for energy. In fact, it was built, it is essentially computing and telecom. So it has communication standards, it has software applications, it's got computers and, and operating standards and networks and operating systems and measurement devices and, and advanced circuits. All of these things have been already out there and in broad use for the last 30 years. So when we talk about bringing a new application into energy and tapping uh, the existing, existing information technology, we're not having to invent anything from scratch. Most of this has already been done. The network. Now this is where it starts to get tricky. But in fact, there's a broad network of players out there that need to be connected for any new energy system to work. And in the case of information and communication technology, that network is the regulatory agencies that oversee the production and distribution, transmission, distribution, and ultimately consumption of power. The utility companies that provide that power, the power producers, the, the, the firms that develop and the, now the, now the commun computing firms and telecom firms and the consumers themselves. It's a broad ranging network and it's an enormous challenge at the policy level and at the strategy level to figure out the ways in which those can come together. But those are the network that in fact we already have in place and, and need to pull together in just the right way. But lastly, I think the most important one is the evolutionary potential. And the reason I say that is because we don't really know the kind of impact that this technology can have. Why do I say that? Because we know the applications that it can meet immediately, but we also know by history that information and communications technology is such a diverse set of technologies that there are any number of ways in which it can be taken, just like the internet was taken before. It can measure the, um, the temperature of transformers and reroute the electrical grid to lower the temperature uh, uh, of the grid itself and therefore increase the efficiency. We know that it can route power to and from homes depending on demand. We know it can monitor uh, energy use in factories and show you where, uh, you know, we can identify air conditioning units that have been running for 20 years in an abandoned shed that nobody's bothered to measure before. These are the kind of opportunities we already know about, but what we don't know about is how people are going to make use of it before. But it's a means of production that's in the hands of so many people that we, we do know that we don't know, that we can't predict it. Compare that to the other technologies that are out there, like solar and wind, where we have a strong understanding of where those technologies are going to go, and we have essentially a theoretical maximum of their contribution, and now it's simply a matter of scaling them up. In a case like this, we don't know what we don't know, and we're looking forward to it. Now that said, what I'd like to do is then finish with uh, some, some advice, some words from a favorite author of mine, William Gibson in thinking about innovation and thinking about information technology, which is, uh, he, was, he, he was writing in the 1980s and he talked about um, the internet, as a matter of fact, and he was the first to, term, uh, to coin the term cyberspace. And when he talked about the internet, he talked about how people would live on, on, online. And his visions were amazingly accurate. And somebody asked him once, how did he become so accurate? How did he, how did he actually capture the future? How did he predict the future? Uh, um, so accurately. And he said it was very simple. He said, the future's already here. It's just unevenly distributed. The way he saw the future was to go out and look at how the kids in Finland were texting 
long before anybody else was. And imagine what it would be like if everybody did that. And then he went to the uh, Akihabara Mall in Japan and he watched how kids were playing with digital pets. And he wondered what it would be like if the world did that. And then he went to the computer science building at MIT and he studied the hackers up there and what they were doing with computing and games. And he wondered what it would be like if the rest of the world was doing that. The way we should be thinking about information technology, about any technology and its impact on the environment is to recognize, in fact, that we need to have that same sort of perspective. See how people are driving these innovations forward in one corner of the world and imagine what it would be like if the rest of the world was doing that. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention. I hope I, I, I've shed some light into how we should be thinking about innovation and particularly on uh, uh, green technology. And I think we have uh, time for questions. Thank you. Uh, good evening. My name is Noman. And I uh, just want to ask you uh, like a uh, recommendation in ICT, like you were talked about communication and all these things. And uh, again, ICT is a regulator. So what they uh, get from the uh, private operators, like there is Voda, there is uh, Qtel as well, and what they did for the improvement in the environment. Are you recommend for R&D fund, for any CSR, corporate social responsibility, anything else? Because again, as a regulatory body, what sh they should do? Okay. How they can contribute into Qatar economy and all. Right. Thank you. So let me make sure I understand the question. First, uh, I do want to make a distinction uh, uh, that, that I think you may already have, but I just want to reiterate. So when I talk about uh, ICT, information communication technology, I mean that as a sector, right? Not as ICT Qatar. Or Qatar. So, uh, uh, um, but that said, uh, what can a regulator do to encourage information and communication technologies adoption? Uh, there are any number of ways that it can be encouraged. I, I work very closely with the regulators in California. And um, essentially, uh, so I, I can't speak to, to Qatar at all but I can talk about California. And one of the primary challenges is to get utilities who make their money uh, in the long run by simply being as efficient as possible at producing or selling power to invest in an alternative future. Um, and, and in many ways, what California must do, California regulators must do, is alter the economic equation by which utilities are, are, are paid, by which they make money. So that investing in smart technology, uh, smart meters, for example, advanced meter reading, uh, is, is in their best economic interest. But we're doing that with a range of, of efforts, uh, including uh, the opportunity for time of use pricing on electricity, which is something that wasn't possible before. Uh, we're doing it in terms of demand response, the ability to reduce peak demand, which I'm sure is a problem here with, with air conditioning in the late afternoon that the utilities you know, have to have the capacity to meet the demands of every home and every business still running their air conditioning. Uh, uh, and, and the ways in which uh, ICT information and communication technology can reduce or essentially enable you to turn off or turn down thermostats. Um, so, but again, uh, much of that's, you know, the role that regulators play is in fact, uh, is in fact helping to shape that, that market, the economic landscape for utilities and other players. And I'm uh, so sorry, but it, it, in, in the U.S., that requires the fundamental recognition that it's not a free market. The utilities are working under regulations, and that's how they make money. And, what's that? Yeah, carbon financing, cap and, cap and trade. All of these things are aspects of, of government creation of the market itself. Yeah. Thanks for your talk. Um, I noticed you spoke a lot about different systems that are currently being used in various different technologies, but to me, innovation starts with the human being itself, and I'd be interested in hearing what you have to say about how people can actually be innovative, because as you said, it's, it's about a collection of ideas, but yeah. how do we get people to start thinking along that stream of thought to open up their horizons and start saying, for my father, for example, he wouldn't use the internet, he would turn to an encyclopedia. So how do we broaden the minds of people to Sure. engage with innovation? So you, it, there's, there's two questions inside your question. The first of which is, I mean, how, how do we get people to be more innovative? On the first side, it's how do we get people to, to lead in innovations, to generate more innovations for us? 
And then the other side is how do we get people to adopt those innovations? You know, I, your father's, I mean, there's still time. In fact, it turns out that one of the largest uh, populations uh, adopting the internet in the US is the over 65 population. They have more time on their hands. And, and they're discovering, in fact, the many ways in which they can reconnect with old friends and, and play bingo online, essentially. Um, so, so, so there's hope yet for your dad. Um, but that said, no, I mean, I think one of the challenges is obviously getting people to adopt these technologies. And the interesting thing about ICT, but, it, but the, the challenge for all innovations is, in fact, in fact, the primary challenge for all technological innovations is to reduce the amount of change that they require in order to be adopted. One of the brilliant things that Edison, Edison did to make the light bulb acceptable was to, to create it in, in the form of the gas lamp. As a very small light bulb, you know, a 13 watt bulb, no brighter than a gas lamp, that was able to be turned on and off individually per lamp, which was fundamentally different from the, the current electric systems, but it was the only way that the public could see and adopt the electric light without changing their own behaviors dramatically. Uh, so one of the challenges for all innovations needs to be how, is it, how are they going to grab a foothold in the market in a way that doesn't require us to change our behaviors. And then after that, they, will have, you know, they, they still have the room to evolve dramatically. But, uh, but to your other question, which is how do we get people to be more innovative in terms of leading change, of creating the opportunity for change, I think one of the ways is thinking about change as a, as a network building process. It's not a process that's necessarily best left to the engineers because in fact it's about creating a network. The MP3 player was nice but without Jobs' ability to convince the record labels to join him in, in the iPod network, it wouldn't have been any different than any other MP3 player. And I think that's, so, so when we think about innovation and think about individuals leading the way, we need to make sure that they understand firmly that they're building networks, not simply building products. Yeah. We have a question. Yeah. Uh, good evening, first. Uh, technology is nice to improve the quality of life, but uh, there's a side effects, a lot of side effects. For example, uh, I am as the head of uh, medical society. Uh, I look uh, for technology in medical side I found very nice solution, but why this solution available? Because this effect of technology, other than weapons or uh, technology of internet, blah, blah, blah. So this side effect, you don't afraid one day uh, it will change the world backward, change the technology to the back, pushing the technology to the back. Uh, because a lot of technology, like for example, let's say the internet. Internet is nice, information, surfaces, blah, blah, blah. But uh, when I be using internet more than six hours, for example, sure. I lose my family. Uh, my family lose me. My country will start losing me. So this is a side effect. Then we will find another solution, maybe by technology, to improve this person from his, from his problem because of technology. So technology sometimes is not very good. Absolutely. I'm not, I'm not here to, to stump for technology, as we would say. I'm not here to say that all, all innovation is good innovation. Uh, I, I would certainly not argue that all technology is good technology. Um, I, I was actually just, just having a conversation about this uh, with the Secretary General. The, you know, there's an, technology advances, it, 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 it's essentially like water. It flows, it takes the path of least resistance. When, you know, when in medicine, pharmaceutical companies offer the path of least resistance, the path of greatest profit, you know, the solutions we find are the solutions that can be patented and, and, and sold as drugs, as medications. Not necessarily the most effective solutions, simply the ones that are most effective and profitable, you know, and, and still profitable. Um, so we see this, in, I mean, obviously we're, we're trying to undo the effects of, of uh, an industrial policy that has not been to the benefit of most people, but has been technologically possible and profitable. Uh, you know, I, I, I would wholeheartedly agree with you that technology can bring unintended and very bad side effects, or intended and very bad side effects. Um, and, I, and I would in no way suggest that that's a good thing.
but yeah, I mean, uh, your point is very well taken. Do we have a? Um, I'm an educator, and I'm wondering how you see education playing a role in developing the innovation necessary for our future and for the uh, use of IT, ICT in energy saving. So, uh, yeah, yeah I mean, full disclosure, I happen, to, I happen to think that there's an enormous opportunity for computing in, in schools. Very much, you know, not, not simply to, to, for kids to play on the internet, but actually for kids to learn how to engage with others and to understand the collaborative role that work can play, or the, you know, the, the, the role of collaboration in work. Uh, one of the things that's an unfortunate side effect of the technology we have in schools is that it, it's geared towards testing and, you know, teaching and testing the individual. And as soon as they enter the working world, that that value goes away because most of the value comes in their ability to work with others. If we can use this to create you know, new educational sort of pedagogies and systems that allow for collaborative work, and I think some good work is being done there already, uh, we can make a profound difference. Now, even on the supply side, teachers are often forced to work alone. They spend most of their time in the classroom with kids and not very much of their time talking to other teachers about the best lessons or the best ways to communicate subjects. I'm watching very closely how teachers are beginning to network with each other and share lesson plans, share materials online where you know, a, a history teacher in Ohio will talk to a network of a hundred and something other history teachers across the country and they'll pool their, their lesson plans and find new ways to teach. So we have, you know, we have opportunities in both of those areas, bringing the kids up to be, to be more comfortable in that technology and also bringing the teachers up themselves. Right. Should we? I don't know if my question is a um, little bit far away from the lecture, but uh, as fun and mental is fundamental, uh, and as a defect of what the technology, that most of our kids spend their time to play um, the video games and PlayStation. So how to take them for, to the green area? Hmm. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I have a nine-year-old daughter. Uh, I live in fear of her playing online. You know, it, uh, I mean, I, I think, I mean, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's a similar question. It's a very challenging question. How do we, I, mean, I, I think that, and that's, that's where family and culture come back and say, this is not acceptable. It's not acceptable to play for six hours. Um, you know, in, 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 our, in our case, it's, you know, power down and pick up a book or or go outside and play. But I think that's where, you know, I mean, technology is not the answer to that one, uh, so much as, as sort of lifestyle. But uh, you know, it, it's far off and you're gonna get me sort of uh, proselytizing. I should be careful with that. We had uh, one question before then and, and then. Oh no, you please. You. Thanks for, uh, Ibrahim Slaty. Uh, thanks for a good uh, presentation. Um, innovation, um, comes out of necessity, and sometimes it comes out of the heck of it. Now, it's also localized, most of it. Now, how to bring that innovation that is done in, say, the States or Europe into and work, at, work it out into a place like the Middle East or the Gulf? How can you do that? Uh, well, I think that's... Uh I think that falls very squarely. I think what I would argue is just a general acceptance that innovation is, in fact, I mean, it, it eventually lands locally, but it can be drawn from anywhere. And to the extent that, I mean, I, I, I spend much of my time, <laughs> clearly I've hit a nerve, I spend much of my time trying to convince the folks in California, as well as the folks across the US, that the reason Europe and, and Japan's energy com consumption per capita is almost half of ours is because they're doing things that, that we could easily do. They have the technology in the automobiles with clean diesel. They have, I mean, they're, they're doing things that are, that are already solved. You know, there could be enormous innovations for the U.S. There, there, there are innovations that covers the globe, but there are 
a lot of innovation that only just localized. Now, my question is how to bring those good innovation that are for a, you know, a place in this world into another place yeah. and make it work. This is my question. Ah, boy, that's a, that's a, that's a long lesson. But I, I mean, I think, I mean, actually, I think I was agreeing with you. You know, what we see is most innovations tend to take unique shapes as they get adapted locally, and, you know, adapted to work locally. But that's also what provides the engine of change, because those adaptations make them effective in yet other localities. But the challenge is to get out and find them. And in fact, there's actually two challenges associated with it. The challenge of finding the innovations that are already out there, the ideas that are already out there and in use somewhere else, and then the ability to bring them in. And those are very different. Yes, to adapt them. The first one takes people who are willing to move easily between uh, locations, cultures, technologies. The second takes local power, takes the ability to make the right connections internally to have something be effective and take hold. The kind of people who are out looking all over the place generally don't have much in the way of local clout or local power. The people who have local power are, are, are there and have that power because they've spent a lot of time internally developing it, and they don't have the time to go out and, and see other things. So in fact, what most often happens is that combination. It's the combination of people who have been out and seen a lot and the people who, in leadership positions or positions of power, recognize the value of bringing those ideas in and use their own political capital to make it happen. But yeah, you, it, the, the challenge is that it's very hard to have both happen simultaneously. Certainly, both happen by the same people. Yeah. We had, you had a question. Yeah. Just talk. Okay. Go. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to make the statement that uh, often we make the mistake of uh, or the assumption that integration is synonymous with the technology. Uh, there are a lot of times we have plenty of examples. I was doing fine. I don't think you need. Yeah. Oops, there you go. I'm loud enough. Uh, where um, innovation has nothing to do really with, with technology. There's certainly no high tech. Um, a good example that comes to mind is uh, microloans. Microloans was sure. a highly innovative approach to make change in the lives of thousands of people in, in right. Bangladesh and won Muhammad Yunus a Nobel Prize. So I just um, want to make sure that we don't get caught up into equating innovation with technology necessarily, where innovation is more about the thinking process rather than the tools used uh, to act or yes. to execute on those thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. very good point. And in fact, I mean, I, yeah, to the extent I would say it's, yeah, it's not about the idea, it's not about the technology. It's not about the mousetrap. Um, and, and in fact, any number of those ideas really were successful only because they were new ways of organizing and thinking about the problem. Yeah, very good point. Yes. We'll, we'll have time for one last question. Uh, Nick Namanucheri from uh, Qatar University. Right here. Thank you. I, I recently was reading an article that Sony um, Corporation uh, created an innovative way of uh, energizing laptop or uh, any devices anyway. Uh, just the way that wireless can, can do it through the air. And of course, this idea has been here for a long time, I'm sure. But uh, it took a long time for this to actually take in place. So this is like other factor, of course, involved that takes uh, such a thing. I would like to you to elaborate on this. Uh, why so long? Uh, I'm not sure exactly uh, how to elaborate on that. But I, I, the question is, why did it take so long for this innovation to come out? Yes, some of, some of those, yeah. Um, you know, I think that's one of the fundamental things that we tend to overlook about innovation. And, and Ford was right. You know, when all the factors that make Ford are ready, uh, you know, it took us a while to, to, to begin to accumulate so many electronic devices that each require little chargers that we would really care to spend the 100 to 200 dollars on a wireless charging system to simplify our lives. You know, when it was one laptop, and then it was one laptop and one cell phone, and now it's one laptop, one cell phone, one iPod, one Game Boy. Uh, there's, you know, it, it's, 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 the market has evolved to the point where a wireless charger is probably, I mean, it's not just the technology that's evolved, but also the market that evolves to need the technology uh, in a way that it didn't before. But I think that's, that's something that tends to be forgotten. I mean, think about uh, the, the motor car. 
It wasn't until people started to have the time to spend to go out on the weekends and drive. It wasn't until there were roads that could be driven on. Uh, because prior to the 1890s, there were no, you know, the roads weren't, were too rutted to, to be driven on. Um, there was uh, enough disposable income that the masses could afford a car. All of these other factors were critical in making the motor you know, Ford Motor Company successful. So I think one of the things we need to take into account with innovation is that it can't move ahead of the market that it's attempting to serve. And so we need to make sure that, you know, that it comes out in ways where there's actually a market need, perceived or not, uh, but there is an actual market need that it can solve. Yeah. I, 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 think, I think that's all the time we have, but I, uh, Brian, I've been told, right? Ah, yeah, we have one question. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is not a question, but I'd like to respond to a statement or a question that okay. uh, was asked about uh, children in schools. I think um, overall, I think what we need to do is we need to stay uh, informed. And I think that technology can connect us to, to be informed, whether locally or globally, about how we can make uh, uh, green innovations. I also think that we need to uh, take responsibility. So, and, and not just as parents, not as schools, but also as children, we need to develop that. Uh, I know that many years ago we started talking about water and that we need to save water. And so children develop the understanding now that you need to save water. So it's the same. Technology and innovation is, is uh, integrated into our daily life. And now we need to develop that understanding, starting with the children, but also connecting with the schools and the parents and taking res responsibility as a, a society and a global society at the end. So just in, in the interest of having the last word, uh, I'll, I'll say I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you, and in fact, some of the best progress we have made in terms of energy efficiency, uh, in terms of uh, smoking, in terms of seat belts, in terms of bicycle helmets, uh, in terms of agricultural practices in the U.S. was teaching the children first and trusting that they would go home and teach their parents. Because if you can teach the child before they turn 14 or 13, they're going to spend the next five years lecturing their parents anyway. So you might as well give them the right things to lecture about. But uh, the 4-H club in the US was organized to teach farmers best practices for, for taking care of animals and for farming by teaching the kids how to do it first. And then they would go home and bring those practices home. So I think you know, the opportunity is both ways. There's a responsibility for us, but also, also an opportunity. If you teach kids these things, they become the generation that then is most attentive to it. You can bring it forward. All right, well, thank you very much. Appreciate it.